Anatomical directions are like the geography of your body. They tell you how to, they allow you to kind of not just relate where landmarks are, but also kind of say like where things are in relation to landmarks. So we covered many things like superior and inferior. We covered cranial and caudal. And then caudal is like referring to a tail, which would be the tailbone in humans. And then posterior, anterior, and dorsal and ventral. We also covered lateral and medial. And we also covered proximal and distal. I believe this is where we left off. So there's something that's not in your anatomy book. I don't think it's in either version. So superficial versus deep. So here's the arm. And say you take an arm and just cut it off like this. And then you look at the cutoff part. Don't worry, this isn't from the anatomy lab. It's a fake arm I found on a certain website with that sends billionaires to space. I know I'm really jealous. Anyway, so again, what? So let's look. Pretend we're looking at that cross section. So what? What happened? What if we go from like the inside of this cross section toward the outside? So when you say someone's superficial, you're saying they're only concern concerned with outer appearances. They're only surface level, right? So superficial means toward the surface. So if you're moving from a deep part of the body, hey, spoiler, towards the surface, you're moving in a superficial fashion. So again, superficial is only skin deep. When they say, say, say uh, if someone's superficial, they're only skin deep, they're referring to that they're only concerned with the outer parts. Now the opposite, like these directions have opposites. If you have one direction, there's an opposite direction. So the opposite direction is deep. So if you're going deeper and some textbooks, and actually this is a good term to know. So when you say someone's profound, you're saying they're very deep, right? They're very thoughtful. They're very intellectual. So again, it's not opposite of superficial. So we have that other common use of superficial and deep. And same with superficial and deep with anatomy. So superficial toward the surface of something, not necessarily the skin, but again, that's a common use of it. And deep is going deeper within a structure. So that's also known as profound. So how about this direction? Would this be superficial or deep? Well, even though it's going in this direction, it's still going towards a superficial direction. Maybe it would be different in lateral versus medial or anterior posterior. But if you're just talking about superficial and deep, you're this direction going here from the inner towards outer. So you can also equivalent uh, a rough equivalent of superficial deep is like superficial is outer, deep is inner. So this would be deep. So it doesn't matter which direction you're coming from. As long as you're going toward the inside of a structure, that's deep. If you're going toward the outside of a structure, that is superficial. So this is why I'm covering that because when we get to the skin, you'll definitely need to know this, these two terms. All right, so we talked about directions. Let's talk about anatomical planes. Now, there are three major sectional planes to the body. And if you take any sort of mathematics, you heard of the X, Y, Z axis. So this is the X, Y, and Z axis of your body. And there are three major planes, and some of them have a little, some have um, multiple names for the, and synonyms for the same plane. So what are the three planes? And again, this is showing like the Martini versus the Open Stacks. But I think the Open Stacks one is okay for what we're going to show. So the frontal or coronal plane. So coronal plane is the frontal plane, vice versa. And if you took this frontal coronal plane that right here and slice someone and looked at that slice, this is what you would see. Now, everyone, when you hear the term corona, what does everyone think of now? You think of this, right? But if you know Latin or if you know Spanish, you know corona means a crown, right? So a crown, so think of it. When, when you could have pageants in person and someone gets crowned, what did they do? They face the audience, they do their pageant wave, and they get a crown placed on their, the, like this, right? So the coronal plane goes like that. So this is the one that cuts you into anterior and posterior sections. So that's what we have here, our frontal plane or coronal plane. Now sagittal plane, say you cut someone on a midline or a line plane parallel to the midline. So this is actually the mid sagittal plane. If you slightly offset it, it would still be a sagittal plane, but basically it's going to divide someone into the left and right half. So this is the mid-sagittal plane if you're straight in the middle. And why don't you see the legs? Well, if you cut down here, there's nothing between the legs over here, so you wouldn't get anything. But you do cut through the torso and the head. So I like to think of it this way. 
I don't believe in astro astrology, but whenever you see this astrological sign, what is this astrological sign? It's Sagittarius, right? And they usually show this in profiles and on the side. So this is what I think of it. It's kind of like a, so seeing it from the sagittal plane, you're kind of seeing this, like, the Sagittarius from the side. So that's the way I can remember it. So this is probably a new vocab word if you haven't encountered it yet. All right, so then there's the third plane. So there's three axes, so there are three planes. The third plane is the transverse, or also known as the horizontal plane. So it's kind of what happens if you take this plane over here. It's kind of like when you see those shows where they take a magician and you, the magician puts their assistant in a box and they saw him or her in half. So this is what you would see if they actually did that and saw that saw his assistant, his or her assistant in half. So the transverse plane is horizontal. It's straight across and it's going to divide someone into a superior and inferior part. So I think of it this way, when you're going across a horizontal bridge, what do you do? You traverse across it. So this is the way I remember, like, transverse is horizontal, horizontal is transverse in terms of the planes. Now, why is it important to know these planes? Well, when you're doing, if you're, especially if you're going to go into anything involving radiology or imaging, this is what we see in a typical, or example of what we would see in a CT scan or computerized tomography. So you're actually able to look through, you don't have to slice someone physically, you can use it using radiation and imaging. And what we see here is that you get multiple perspectives of the inside of the body. So here we have a sagittal plane, here we have a frontal or coronal plane, and here we have a transverse plane, and you can see things like the kidneys over here. So the thing about this is that you have to label which, when you get these type of reports, typically they'll tell you which plane this CT scan is taking from. So if you're interested in x-rays, radiology, or being a rad tech, this is something you have to get very, or if you're anything radiology, you have to be very, very familiar and with using anatomical terminology. Okay, and then the last major anatomical concept I want to cover in the basics are cavities. So what we see here with cavities, well, what's a common way you think of cavities? Well, you think, well, like when you go to the dentist, ooh, I have a cavity, I have a hole somewhere. So cavities are like spaces in your body. So when they talk about cavity search, I'm trying to talk about looking at different spaces in the body. But as you can see, there are many different spaces within the body. And this is the open stacks version, and this is the martini version over here. So the thing about cavity, like when you think of cavity in terms of like dentistry, you think, okay, it's a hole. Therefore, it's some sort of gap or space. Kind of, sort of. So I think it's more, when you use to talk about cavities and anatomy, think of them more like spaces. So it doesn't mean necessarily that means they're hollow and full of air. On the contrary, something occupies the cavities in the human body. So the thing is that cavities are also contained with each other, within each other. So they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, organ or a body part is not part, so it won't be like a body part is only part of one cavity and none of the other cavities. There are big cavities, there are smaller sections of other cavities, so you can have a cavity within a cavity within a cavity. So here we have several cavities and this big one over here is what we call the ventral cavity. And within the ventral cavity you also contains the thoracic cavity and hey remember our Thor and our chest, so again this is the upper cavity over here and then there's a sheet of muscle called the diaphragm that separates it from the abdominal pelvic cavity. And this diaphragm, again, it's a sheet of muscle, so it's actually a firm barrier between these two cavities. Now, these cavities also have smaller cavities contained with them. So in, you can't really see the pleural cavity very well in this picture. Go to the previous OpenStax picture for a better view of that but you also have the pericardial cavity as well within the thoracic cavity. Now with the abdominal pelvic cavity, you also have the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. So you can have smaller cavities within another cavity within a bigger cavity. So again, I like to think of cavities not as hollow spaces, hollow areas that are full of air, but in anatomy, I like to think of them as spaces. So let's use a little analogy. So if you're on campus, what are, where are you? Well, you might be in a UH dorm. And if you're in the UH dorm, well, are you just in the dorm? 
are you also in this greater Honolulu metropolitan area? Yes, you are. So you're in the dorm and you're in the Honol greater Honolulu area, right? Are you in the Hawaiian Islands if you're in the UH dorm? Yes, you're in the UH dorm, you're in the Honolulu, and you're also in the Hawaiian Islands. Same with like something like the heart. The heart is in ra actually enclosed by, not within the pericardial cavity, but it's surrounded by it. So it's surrounded by the pericardial cavity, and then the pericardial cavity is contained within the thoracic cavity, and the thoracic cavity and the pericardial cavity are also within the ventral cavity. So is the heart within the thoracic cavity? Yes, it is. Is it within the ventral cavity? Yes, it is. So an organ, a part, can be part of contained within multiple cavities. Then again, cavities aren't mutually exclusive. Sometimes one can contain the other. All right, so then let's go to, now we covered a lot of anatomy so far in, this, in our first few lectures. Now let's talk about the very basics of physiology. So one co important concept with physiology is homeostasis. And this woman right here, she's balancing. And homeostasis is all about balance and keeping your body's balance. So it's not just about like balancing in terms of gravity, but the thing is like not only about your overall body's position, it's also maintaining the internal conditions within your body. Your body is living, it's always changing, and it's always adjusting. So the thing about this is that your body is made out of cells and your cells have to keep alive in order to keep yourself alive because your cells make up your tissues which make up your organs which make up you. So you need to keep your cells alive because if your cells die, you die. So this is why you need to make your cells happy and keep them alive. So you have uh, optimal conditions in terms of nutrition, in terms of osmotic or like the certain chemical balance and concentrations around your cells. And also in terms of the oxygen, carbon dioxide, all these things you need to keep your cells alive and happy. The thing about homeostasis is not a single state. It's not in terms of like, okay, you can only be at this temperature, you can only be at this blood glucose level, you can only have this one set value. Well, there's an ideal value, but typically a normal healthy range. So the thing is that homeostasis allows your body to go past its normal or its comfortable level but it tries to bring it back to that comfortable level. So it tries to restore balance. Even if something throws off or moves uh, your balance of your body or something, some sort of measurement in your body away from normal, your body through homeostasis will try to bring it back to keep the, your cells and body alive. So again, homeostasis is essential to life and essential to many physiological processes. Basically, if something changes from your normal status, you have to have a way to bring it back, otherwise that can lead to for harm to your body and your cells within. Okay, so how do you restore homeostasis? Well, again, remember homeostasis is not only about having a normal state, but also bringing things back to a normal state. An example of this is get temperature. So the book likes to use this example for temperature. So negative feedback. Negative feedback is a very important overall th theoretical concept in homeostasis and when we get to and we actually cover this more in depth in Phil 142 but what is negative feedback well it, so something's negative something is inhibiting something so it allows changes but keeps things in check so with homeostasis and negative feedback negative feedback you typically have something a causing something b but in negative feedback that something b turns off the original something a so it's a feedback loop because A and B are playing off each other, but along that way, A activates B, but B turns off A. And I like to use this little example. So this little cute box, what is it doing? Well, it's turning itself off. And this is why I love this example, because what happens? Well, the box likes staying closed and undisturbed, but what can you do? You can disturb it by flipping the switch, by flipping the switch, it activates all this machinery that turns itself off. So it's going back to its original closed state. Now, is this system changing? Yep, it is changing, but it's turning itself off and trying to restore itself to its original state. So homeostasis is like that. You can have changes in the system, but to maintain normal conditions in your body, this change, any sort of disturbances in your balance in your body should be restored back to its normal and healthy state. Okay, so then, 
So another example. So here is Ms. Spears, and what is she doing? She, well, this is her concert, and after a big concert, what is, what is she doing? She, or if you've seen her Instagram, then she gets all sweaty. So why do we sweat? Well, when you're doing all this movement or doing dancing on stage or any exercise, you're going to get really, really hot, right? So your body temperature is going to increase. So your bodies and your, and your, te your cells, they like certain temperatures, but if it gets too hot, that can be harmful to your body and cells. So how do we cool ourselves off? Well, what cools us off when we, what do we do when we get too hot and our body temper core temperature gets too high? We start to sweat. So, yep, so sweat and why? Because why do we spray ourselves with water if we're also really hot? Well, the thing is that water absorbs heat. So water absorbs heat. So if she is absorbing our body temperature and our overheating our, that's elevated, it's going to cool us off. And yeah, so Brittany is very happy because now she's freeing and winning her legal ballot battles. So yeah, she's is she also happy? She's restoring her homeostasis in her body temperature. So this is negative feedback. So again, what happens? Her exercise caused heat, but that heat caused sweating. That sweating lowered her body temperature, so it's back to its normal homeostatic state. All right, so then let's talk about levels of structural organization. So this is the OpenStax version, but basically we are made of organs that are made out of tissues, that are made out of cells, and that these cells have proteins and other molecules within them, and molecules are made out, made out of atoms. So this is where we're made out of smaller, smaller components that interact with each other. And as you build larger and larger structures, they get more, are able to take on more and more complex functions as well. So atomic, chemical, and cell, cellular level, and then you get to the tissue level, organ level, and then organ system level. And this makes up you. So again, you should know this order because again, which is smallest and which is largest. And why is this important? Are you just memorizing this just for the sake of that? Well, the thing is that here we have Alzheimer's disease. So if you know someone who or have a loved one with Alzheimer's disease, you know how kind of devastating it can be. So what is one of the major con or causes of Alzheimer's disease? And it involves something called the beta amyloid peptide. So a peptide is a small protein. And what happens is that this beta amyloid pe peptide is going to cause problems with the cellular especially the, at the cellular level with the neurons. And affecting neurons also affects the overall function of the brain. Over, affecting the overall function of the brain is also going to affect the overall function of and psychology and physiology of a person. So this is showing you that a problem at one level, at the protein level, can also cause problems at the cell level, can also cause problems at the tissue level, cause problems at the organ level, and cause problems in the whole body. So this is why it's important to know these levels of organizations. If you have a problem at any of these levels, they can affect pro other part levels of organization from the smallest to the largest part of your body. And let's see, so we're going to start off with the very, very smallest level. And I see a little question about packbacks. So yes, you do. there is a subscription fee. And it's a one-time payment, so it's not like for you have to pay it for every month. <laughs> if it would be really expensive, if it was every month, it lasts you for the entire one-for-one one class. Okay, so now let's talk about the chemical level. So chemistry. So okay, there is chem 161 and 162. You're, I'm not going to cover everything you're supposed to know in that in this class, but again, you should have had. You should have had. I high school chemistry. I'm just going to cover the basics that you kind of need to know for this class, or you. Sh I'm just going to cover the basics you should know for this class. Okay, so if you see someone drawing an atom, you might have seen this old model. It's really cool. It's a nice graphic representation. But from Chem 6 161, you'll probably learn that this is an old-fashioned way of seeing this. So it's not like the nucleus is the sun and all the electrons are like little plants that orbit it. So this is an outdated model. And the thing about the nucleus is that it's surrounded by electrons, but these electrons are buzzing around them in electron clouds. Now, if you've taken chemistry, you've probably heard about things like orbital shapes. 
do I really is that really relevant for our class? Not so much for our class, but well, you should know that electrons are always kind of buzzing. And I like this little gif right here. So what happens here? You see all these electrons. So they're kind of swarming this nucleus. So they're not orbiting it. They're kind of around these nucleus and they're flitting in and out. So electrons also involve probability and don't get too far into the weeds with chemical quantum mechanics. If you're studying things like quantum mechanics, then you're going way too far for the, beyond the scope of this class. But sub subatomic particles, you need to know the very three elementary subatomic particles in terms of like uh, what makes up an uh, atom. So we have our protons, and our neutrons, and our electrons. If you're going to things like quarks or string theory, you're going way too beyond the <laughs> scope of this class. You just need, this is the smallest you need to know, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So protons have a positive charge. So they have a positive one charge and their weight is a one mass unit. And where do you find protons? You find them in the nucleus of an atom. Now neutrons, they are neutral. They don't have electrical charge, so they have zero charge. They're equal in weight to a proton and they're also found in the nucleus. Now electron, there's no, so it's not an electron, it's just, net, but the electrons are negative. So they have a negative one charge, and compared to protons and neutrons, they are very tiny. So even though in that previous picture it was showing electrons very, very big and about the size of a proton, in reality, they are super tiny compared to a proton or neutron. So a proton, yeah, almost over 1,800 times the mass of an electron. And these surround the nucleus. So you find protons and neutrons, which are relatively big, in the nucleus, protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and negatively charged electrons, they're buzzing around a nucle uh, nucleus. So this is a summary of the subatomic particles. Now let's talk about atomic structure. So what is the nucleus? Well, whenever you refer, so the thing about the term nucleus, at the atomic level, we're talking about the inside of an atom. And nucleus is one of those words where it has multiple definitions compared uh, depending on the context. Like the nucleus of an atom is different from the nucleus of a cell. They're talking about two different things and I think you will have like at least by the end of this whole course series maybe four different definitions of nucleus. This is one of them. So protons have a positive charge and then it's also found in the nucleus along with neutrons. So entire this entire structure together when you have protons and neutrons forming a central structure this is called the nucleus. Now these electrons, these are in those, electro, those electron shells and clouds that surround the nucleus, and these have a negative charge. And again, I'm not showing it to scale here because if you look at the previous numbers, if I showed this to scale, you wouldn't be able to see the electrons on, in this image. But for simplicity, for clarity's sake, I'm showing the electrons oversize in this picture. So you have electron shells. Now, do I want you to know how, if, if you're studying valence shells, I think that's a little, I mean, I think, I know it's mentioned in the book, but I think it might be a little beyond, like, do you need to know how many electrons are in each orbital shell? That's more of a Chem 161 thing. What I want you to know is what electrons do, especially in terms of bonding and ionics, or, and, um, yeah, and ions. Not ionics. <laughs> All right, so then atomic elements. So what is an atomic number? Well, the atomic number is what defines an element in terms of on the periodic table. So the number of protons in an atom it represents the atomic number of an atom and therefore the element. So when you look at the periodic table, you might see symbols like this. Well, this is atomic symbol, this abbreviation over here. This is the full element name. And this number over here, is it just labeling it in an arbitrary order? No, that number actually means something. That number is the number of protons. So here we have the full name, here we have the element symbol, and this is the atomic number. So this is a cartoon showing the structure of helium. And hey, how many protons does it have? It has two positive particles, right? So number two is refers to the number of protons. So every single element on the atomic or the periodic table, this number over here represents the number of protons in that atom. If it's a different, if an atom has a different number of protons, it would be the next number in the sequence. 
So what if you could change, like say you had a very, very expensive particle smasher or some accelerator that can actually change the number of protons in the atom, what would that do to the atom? Well, the thing is that here we have carbon and carbon with an atomic number of six. Or let's ask the chat. So carbon has an atomic number of six. How many protons does carbon have? Okay, looks like everyone is in consensus, yet the chat has consensus that it's 6, and the chat is correct. So again, that's your atomic number, therefore that's the number of protons. Okay, so carbon, where can you find carbon? You find carbon in your body, but these are other forms of carbon as well. Here we have a presumably graphite, and here's a diamond. So. If, you're, if you want to get very persnickety about things, yeah, there's hydrogen atoms helping out with the outside of the structure. But most of the structure of this is carbon, especially on the inside. Okay, so what we have here is that if you add this, what if you added a proton to carbon? Would it still be the carbon? No, it wouldn't be carbon anymore, right? Because that changed the number. Therefore, you would, if you change the number of protons in an atom, that would change the element. So now we have nitrogen with the atomic number of seven. And nitrogen, where can you find nitrogen? Well, actually, it's around 70% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. And here, it, now, it, this used to be in Ala Moana, but now they it shut like several years ago. If you're able to eat this, like they, what they did was mix in like liquid nitrogen with ice cream or like some sort of cream to make ice cream. But the thing is that nitrogen is uh, typically found, at least pure nitrogen, in a gas form. Now then, the thing is, like, is nitrogen the same as carbon? No, it's a, it was in a gas form, right? Say you add another proton to nitrogen, what would you get? Would you still have nitrogen? No, now you have oxygen. Is oxygen the same as nitrogen? Can you survive on nitrogen alone and breathing nitrogen alone without any oxygen? Nope. But oxygen is the one all our cells need if, in order to perform aerobic re respiration and keep up with our energy demands. So, or if you're not getting enough oxygen, well, you need, might need a supplemental oxygen. Oxygen is essential for human life. So the thing with protons and elements, protons determine your elements, and different elements have different properties. Carbon is not the same as nitrogen. Nitrogen is not the same as oxygen. Oxygen is not the same as carbon. They have different amount of protons in their atoms. They have different properties in terms of their chemical and physical properties. So again, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, different atomic numbers, diff totally different properties. Another way to think of it, another mnemonic, is protons determine an element's personality. So again, the number of protons, very important for determining the properties of a atom. Okay, so then we have our element name. So here's the essential elements for fill one for one and one for two. And there is, a, even though it seems kind of random, I kind of organize them by their frequency in the body and how much we cover them or refer to them in physiology and anatomy and physiology and medicine. So these are more like trace elements or things that, or actually fluoride is more if you're going to like pharmacology or if, if you're going to dentistry or but yes yeah, the thing is like these are all kind of going by frequency and how often these elements come up but you should know all of them in terms of like not only their element symbol do you need to know their atomic number uh, you should know what an atomic number is now I'm not going to ask you okay what's the atomic number of magnesium that's kind of like a little more like nice to know you probably need to know that for Chem 161, but for Phil 1 for 1, not really. But you should know the full name of all of these elements I listed right here. Okay, so then, what if you could change the number of neutrons? What role do neutrons have in the atom? Well, the thing is that there are, if you could change the number of neutrons in the atom, what would happen? So we added, there are six neutrons originally in this carbon atom. 
what if you added another, a seventh neutron? Would it still be carbon? So about 70% of you said yes, and said, and or actually 68% of you said yes, 31% said no. Thing is that if we just added one neutron, does that change the number of protons? How many protons do we have? We still have six protons. We changed the number of neutrons, but there's there are still six protons. So the thing is that we actually changed the overall weight of the the nucleus. But this is still carbon. It's now just a little heavier because a neutron does have mass. It has equal mass or roughly equal mass to a proton. So what we actually did is create an isotope of carbon. So this, both of this is still both like its original state and it's a state with like having a, another additional neutron. They're both still carbon. The one with seven neutrons it would be a little heavier than the version of carbon with only six neutrons. So this is what we call an isotope. So what we actually saw is something called carbon-12 with the, just like six protons and six neutrons. But when you have six protons and seven neutrons, it's what we call carbon-13. And if you added another neutron, you would have carbon-14. And you may have heard this, especially if you've like heard about carbon dating and also archaeology. So yes, these are isotopes. So you have the same chemical original element, but if you change the number of neutrons, these different numbers of neutrons with that are of the same element. So same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. These are isotopes. So yeah, well you can have multiple different isotopes. They're still going to be carbon. They're all going to have the same amount of protons. What's the difference? They all have different numbers of neutrons. And why does that matter? Well, remember that protons have weight, so do neutrons. So the thing is that the mass number is referring to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So the greater the mass number of an atom, the heavier that atom is. So a carbon-14 atom is going to weigh more than a carbon-12 atom, and a carbon-12 atom is going to weigh more than a carbon-11 atom because protons and neutrons have mass, they have weight. Now let's talk about the third uh, atomic particle. So the third one we're going to talk about, what's left? Electrons. Now here we have fluorine, and fluorine, again, atomic number nine. How many protons does it have? Well, definitely you can count them. There are also nine. Now here we're showing fluorine with nine electrons, but typically when you have a fluorine in like the human body, if you ha introduce it to the human body, well, what typically happens is that fluorine will tend to take on an additional electron. And this is, if you want more details about this, then you should read more about valence shells. But what I'm getting at here is that sometimes you can have unequal numbers of protons and electrons. In the, all the atoms in your body, the, each atom is not going to have an equal amount of protons and electrons. Sometimes you have something called an ion. So an ion, by definition, is an atom where the number of protons is not equal to the number of electrons. And you have many types of ions in your body, including the electrolytes. So in this example of an ion, what do we have? Well, we have nine protons and, and 10 electrons. Now, the thing is that, remember in the previous slides, I said that protons have a positive one charge, electrons have a negative one charge. So what's the overall charge of this fluorine ion? Well, what you do is take 9 times positive 1, which is 9, and then take 10 times negative 1, which is negative 10. Add the two together, and what do you get? All right, let's ask the chat. So if you have 9 minus 10, what do you get? What's the answer? What's the charge of this fluorine ion that took on an electri additional electron? Yep, looks like everyone's saying negative one and you're all correct. So that sign is very important. It's not positive one. So the charge isn't just one. You need that negative sign because this fluorine ion is overall negative. So it's a negative one charge. Now here we have sodium. So sodium, atomic number 11, therefore 11 protons. But say we lose an electron over here. So what's the new charge of this so so sodium ion? So we have 11 protons. Protons have a positive one charge. Electrons have a negative one charge. What is the, the overall charge on the sodium ion? Well, 11 minus 10, it would be plus one. 
that would be the charge of this sodium. So sometimes you also see that whenever you have this number up here in the upper right corner, that refers to the overall charge of that particle it, or, or atom. If there's no charge, it's not going to, sometimes they use a zero, but if it's an ion, it's going to show you a plus or negative some number because again, it would have to have some sort of unequal balance between protons and electrons. Great, so it seems like people get it. All right, so here we have a hydrogen atom, but now, it, so here in this, this original state, we're showing a proton, electron, so there's no charge. But the thing is that with hydrogen in the body, what happens is that it tends to lose the electron and it has a plus one charge, right? So no proton, one minus zero is one. Thing is that in the universe, 99.9% .9 of hydrogen has no neutron. So if you have a hydrogen ion and it has no neutron, what do you have? You only have a proton. So this is why you might see like hydrogen ions is equal to H plus is equal to sometimes they talk refer to hydrogen ions as simply protons. And why is that? Well, by definition, if it's an ion, it's not going to have an equal amount of electrons and it's positive one. So it's not going to have an electron. And most hydrogen in our universe doesn't have a neutron. So what are you left with? Just a bare naked proton. So this is what we have with a hydrogen atom or a hydrogen atom. Hi, a specific hydrogen atom called a hydrogen ion, also known as H plus in abbreviation, also known as a proton. Okay, so then molecules and compounds. So these definitions, so a chemical bond. So when I think of like chemical bonds, the way I like to think of chemical bonds is that when you're forming a bond with someone, you're forming a relationship, right? And it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. You can have relationships with your friends. You can bond with friends. You can have relationships with family. You can bond with family. So here's a so chemical bonds are pretty much relationships between atoms. So there's some sort of attraction or bond between these atoms and then molecules. So when molecule refers to when you have multiple atoms that are bonded together. So these are atoms in a relationship. Now an element, so atomic elements refer to referring to the number of protons. So if all the atoms have in a molecule have only one type of atomic element, it's still an element. Now a compound, this is when you have any sort of mix, at least two different atoms bonded together. This is a molecule with at least more than one type of element. So it doesn't matter if it has like two, three, four, a dozen different atoms, different elements bound together. As long as it's not a pure element, it will be a compound for at least for a molecule. So then we're, when you see a chemical formula of something, it lists how much of each element is in the molecule. So here we have all these molecules over here. And if you're going to write out the chemical formula of all of these, you're going to see notation like this. So this number here in the lower right, that refers to the number of atoms found in that compound or molecule or element. So these are all elements over here. But see that in this hydrogen ga gas particle right here, you have two hydrogens and here we have oxygen gas and we have ozone over here. So notice that there are three oxygens here and there are two oxygens here. And these are all compounds we see over here. So what we have are multiple types of atoms and then they're all chemically linked together. This is still an element because it's a pure type. And even if it has an ionic charge, this over here is still an element because it only, even though it has a different charge on this atom, both of these are still oxygen molecules. But again, if it only has one type of atom, it's an element. If it has multiple types, it's a compound. Okay, so let's talk about different types of chemical bonds for, uh, before we leave off for the weekend. So ionic bonds, these are between cations and anions. So cations are, have an overall char positive charge and anions have a negative charge. And then the way I like to think of it, so a nice mnemonic is that if you're, you're a cat lover, a cat is a positive influence in your life. And cats, so I like to think that cations are positive. If you have a cat, they're very calming. You're, you're petting your cat. It's a positive influence. Anions I just use by pop process of elimination. So if cations are positive, anions are negative. Then covalent bonds, these are strong bonds that share electrons. So polar covalent is when you have an unequal sharing hydrogen and then you also have, 
So there are nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. We'll cover that real quick in the next few slides. And hydrogen bonds. So these don't actually involve electrons being transferred or shared between atoms, but it involves partial positive or negative charges on an atom. I'll explain it really shortly. Okay, so ionic bonding is one of the easiest types of bonding. So here we have a sodium ion and a chloride ion. So, so we actually reverse that. Here we have a sodium atom and a chloride atom. So this sodium actually has it in this initial state has a equal amount of positive and negative positive and or protons and electrons. And this chloride ion has no charge. But what if you transfer one electron from sodium to chloride? Well, if you did that, that would change it, this number to ten, only 10 electrons, and this would increase the number of electrons on the chloride atom. Now, what are these, are these ions? So now, with, if they have this amount of subatomic particles, well, remember, by definition, ions have an unequal amount of protons and electrons, right? So these, this is now a sodium ion that has a positive 1 charge. Again, 11 minus 10 is positive 1. And this chloride ion that gained an electron will have a negative 1 charge. So this cation, now remember cations, cats have a positive influence on your mood. So cations are positive. Now this is a negative anion, and ionic bonding just refers to the attraction between positive electric charges and negative electric charges. So if you heard that term, opposites attract, well, this is probably the basis of that common term. So these are going to bond together because they're attracted to each other's electrical charge. So cations attract anions and vice versa. But this is an interesting thing about um, electronics or electric and magnetic forces. Similar charges and similar forces repel each other. Opposites attract. Now covalent bonds, what do we have here? So we still have electrons, but instead of ripping off one electron and giving it to another atom, now these, uh, so again, if you want more detail, talk, you should read the, about valence shells in the chemistry or in Chem 161. But at this point, you just need to know, at least in the physiological level, sometimes instead of like trying to rip off an electron completely, these the two, these two atoms are now sharing electrons. So here we have two hydrogen atoms sharing electron, a pair of electrons. Same with these two oxygen atoms. They're now sharing a pair of electrons. So this is what you call a covalent bond. Whenever these two, you have two atoms linked together in a bond and they have electrons shared between them, this is what we call a covalent bond. So, the, so for these electrons, these are part of both atoms. They're being shared in common. Now covalent, polar covalent bonds, they are a subtype of covalent bonds, a special type of covalent bond. So here we have, um, so we have two hydrogen ion, or atoms, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Now the interesting thing about oxygen is that here we have electrons, but they're being shared unequally. So the thing is about oxygen, it likes to hold on to electrons more than hydrogen. Like, they pretend that they're trying to share, but oxygen is a little stronger and it's trying to grab onto these electrons a little more. So it's kind of like an re unequal relationship. Like, say you have, you like to share your bike or your car or skateboard with your friend, but your friend tends to borrow it more often than you use it. Same with the oxygen atoms in a water molecule like this. Oxygen, in terms of if it's bonded to hydrogen, tends to win the tug of war and bring over the electrons a little more toward its side than the hydrogen atoms. So the thing is that if the electrons spend more time on the oxygen atom than with the hydrogen atom, what does that do to the overall charge in this particle or this molecule? Well, the thing is that if these electrons spend more time with oxygen, this makes oxygen in a water molecule slightly negative. And then this also makes the, the, the hydrogens in a water molecule slightly positive. Why? Well, these hydrogens are kind of missing out on this, this negative charge. So they're actually kind of losing a slight negative charge. And they're also having a slight, so, but, and, why is, and where does that negative charge go to? 
that goes to the uh, oxygen atom. So this is overall molecule itself. It has a, a overall doesn't have overall charge, but if you're looking at these individual atoms, they do have slight charges. So if you're taking Chem 161, you might hear this term called dipole, and that's what I'm referring to. And let's see, should you, if we attend lecture, should we read the textbook as well or just the, or just, just the other? Whatever helps it stick in your mind. Some people want more detail. If you're fine with just the lectures, you can just view the lectures. But if you want a little more detail, especially with things like chemistry or things that I, because I, again, I go very general and sometimes with this stuff, if you want more detail and it helps your knowledge, read the textbook. Okay, so hydrogen bonding. So things that, because in the water, so here I'm showing a bunch of water molecules and their water molecules are attracted to each other. Now, does that mean these water molecules are attracted by sharing electrons with each other? They're not actually sharing electrons. So whenever you see this hydrogen bonding between water molecules, it's actually due to the slight positive and negative charges on, on the, so slight positive charges on a hydrogen atom and slight negative charges on an oxygen atom in a water molecule. So remember that positive attracts negative. So this is what, this is often a point of confusion when people are first learning about atomic or chemical bonds and hydrogen bonding. They think one, hydrogen bonding only involves hydrogen and it involves hydrogen bonding to itself. That's not exactly correct. So again, here we have hydrogen involved but it's more about the charges being attracted to each other due to the polar covalent bonds, not due to actual sharing electrons between hydrogen and something else. So the thing is that electron, yep, so I'm in, in underscoring this right here. This attraction is not due to actual electrons being held between these two molecules. Okay, so then the hydrogen bond is weaker than a covalent bond. So this is why so, so bonds, they hold things together, but remember just kind of like relationships and bonds between people, some are stronger than other. Covalent bonds are very strong. Ionic bonds can be strong depending on the charge and how much solubility you have. But hydrogen bonding is pretty weak. So this is why we're able to, like if you have a glass of water, you can stick your finger into the, a glass of water pretty easily, right? Or if you're taking a bath, you can just put your finger into a bathtub pretty easily. But does that mean that these are totally weak bonds that have no strength altogether? Well, let's use this example. So here we have hydrogen bonds holding all the water molecules here in this pool over here. And the, I think believe this is a Kahanamoku pool on campus. What if you have a bunch of water molecules together? So. Does that, we have all these hydrogen bonds holding this water molecules together, right? But is it going to be just like dipping your finger into water when you're doing a dive like that? Probably not. He's probably going to be super sore after that. So the thing is, or what if you dive off a very high bridge and belly flop like he did over there? Then it's going to be pretty painful, right? So if you have a bunch of hydrogen bonds together, it can actually form a pretty strong structure overall.